death shall ever from the Lord his children sever unto them his grace he showeth and their sorrow all he knoweth though he giveth or he taketh God his children The love of God, the faith of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you. Welcome to worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Beacon, New York, where together we are bridging worlds, encountering God, and healing lives. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever your background, we are glad you have joined us and hope you find just what your soul needs today. If you have a candle with you, we invite you to light it now as a reminder of the light of Jesus in all times and places. We continue with our prayer of confession. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you have water in a container, we invite you to pour the water as a reminder of the grace and power of baptism. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Good morning, everybody. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about some special songs and poems that we find in the Bible called Psalms. And we talked about one of those Psalms, Psalm 150, that's 
all about giving praise to God. Do you remember? Well, today we're going to hear another psalm in just a few minutes. And you know what? I thought I would bring back an old friend of ours to help us talk about this next psalm. Um, hold on. Uh, Seymour? 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 Ah, okay. <laughs> Hi, Seymour. It's so good to see you again. Welcome back. So we're talking about a new psalm today, okay? And this psalm is a little bit different than the one from a couple weeks ago. This psalm is one that brings a lot of comfort to many people, especially when they're sad or scared. Yeah. Have you heard it before? It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Have you heard that, Seymour? Hmm. Well, then let's talk about it a little bit, okay? So, the Lord is my shepherd. God is a shepherd? What is this psalm talking about? Right? Well, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd is a person who takes care of sheep. And one of the shepherd's most important jobs was leading the sheep to food, to green pastures or meadows. The shepherds also need to make sure that there were streams or pools with clean water for their sheep to drink. If a sheep wandered away from the flock, the shepherd had to go and find it and bring it back. And shepherds also protected the sheep from harm, such as wolves and thieves. I know. Well, many people believe that this psalm, which is Psalm 23, was written by a king named David. Mm -hmm. And he himself was a shepherd when he was a boy. In Psalm 23, David describes God as a shepherd. Just like a shepherd takes such good care of his or her sheep, God takes care of David. God is with David through good times and the not so good times. God is the shepherd and David is a sheep. <laughs> Hmm, Seymour, do you think that God could be our shepherd too? Oh, huh. does God love us and take care of us? For sure. Is God with us when things are going really great and when things are not going great? Yeah. So, just like a shepherd is always caring for his or her sheep, God cares for us. Yeah. Jesus even says that he is the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. I know. That's really great news, isn't it, Seymour? So, mm, I guess that makes us all sheep. <laughs> Yeah. Did you know that you are a sheep? Let's make some sheep ears. Mm, let's see, Seymour, can you make a sheep ear? There we go. Let's make some sheep ears and I want you to sing a song with me, okay? It goes like this. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. All right. That was a good practice round, but let's do it one more time. And I want to hear everybody be some sheep. Okay, here we go. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. 
Great job, everybody. Great job, Seymour. Yeah. So whenever you hear Psalm 23, you can remember that just like a shepherd cares for his sheep, God is our shepherd and we are God's sheep. So let's pray Psalm 23 together for our prayer. Would you repeat after me? Dear God, you are my shepherd. I will never be in need. You let me rest in fields of green grass. You lead me to streams of peaceful water. and you refresh my life. And all God's people said, Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, beginning at verse 36. Hear now God's word for us today. In the city of Joppa, there was a follower named Tabitha. Her Greek name, Dorcas, means a deer. She was always doing good and helping the poor. While Peter was in Lydda, Tabitha became sick and died. Her body was washed and put in a room upstairs. The followers in Joppa heard that Peter was in Lydda. Lydda is near Joppa. So they sent two men to Peter. They begged him, hurry, please come to us. Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. All the widows stood around Peter, crying. They showed him the shirts and coats that Dorcas had made when she was still alive. Peter sent everyone out of the room. He kneeled and prayed. Then he turned to the body and said, Tabitha, stand up. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called the saints and the widows into the room. He showed them Tabitha. She was alive. People everywhere in Joppa learned about this, and many believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for many days with a man named Simon, who was a leather worker. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. Today's focus scripture is Psalm 23, a familiar, a favorite, you all know it. Though I'm going to be reading a different translation. Uh, The one that you're probably most accustomed to is beautiful, heavily influenced by the King James translation, but I think this one is more accurate. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to water in places of repose. He renews my life. He guides me in right paths as befits his name. Though I walk through a valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table for me in full view of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My drink is abundant. Only goodness and steadfast love shall pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years. Hey there. So a few years ago, my family and I were lucky to be able to travel to Italy for a while. And while we were there, we were in Rome. And one day in Rome, we took a bike tour along the Appian Way. Now, for those who don't know, the Appian Way was the original superhighway 
back in 312 BCE, Rome built this highway and it went all the way from Rome down to Naples and eventually to Brindisi. And that was key because that was a port city where they would do their importing and exporting to Greece and Egypt. And so this road, this Appian Way, this was key in the development of Rome. And it's still there. <laughs> this road that's 2300 years old it's still there and so we got to do this bike tour and we got to go along the Appian Way and we saw a lot of cool things you know, at one point there were the aqueducts of Hadrian these huge stone cement structures and right next to a golf course so there's these ancient structures and there's guys golfing I felt like I was in the middle of a Fellini film along the Appian Way they have a catacomb that you can visit and tour. It's the catacomb of San Callisto. And again, for those who don't know, catacombs where that's where ancient peoples were buried. And you were buried with your group. All there was a Christian catacomb, pagan catacombs, Jewish catacombs. You were buried with your people. And it wasn't, you know, nobody was being persecuted or anything. It's just all these bodies in Rome had to be buried somewhere, so you were buried with your own. And they went underground into these tunnels and caves. So we took a tour of this catacomb. The bodies had been cleared out. We walked through the, two, the tunnels, and we went into the caves where you would see certain families had been buried or individual places. And there was art all over the place, paintings on the wall, Beautiful, beautiful paintings. A lot of Jonah. A lot of paintings of Jonah. And I wondered about that, but there were a lot of paintings of Jonah. Very few of Jesus, and absolutely none with Jesus on the cross. Nowhere. Nowhere and nowhere was Jesus painted on the cross. Now, the pictures of Jesus, they were all somewhat similar. It was a young guy, didn't have a beard, was usually in a meadow, um, but nowhere on the cross. About a month ago, I took a seminar, I attended a seminar, and it was on early Christian art, the art of our religion, through the first six or seven centuries. And in all that time, scholars have been able to find only two, two depictions of Jesus on the cross. Just two. And one of them they don't even think was Jesus. They think it was someone else. The earliest crucifix we have, it comes from the 10th century. It was found up in Cologne, Germany. It's called the Giro Cross. And there's Jesus on the cross. And that's the earliest one we have. It was only in the ninth century that we started to see some pictures of Jesus on a cross, some paintings. And it wasn't until the 11th century when this idea of atonement theology really took hold. It wasn't until then that we started to see a prevalence of pictures of Jesus on the cross. Not coincidentally, these pictures coincided with the Crusades. When it became a religious duty a religious act to go kill Muslims and Jews. That's about the time we started to see this representation of atonement theology. That's when paradise became an afterlife thing. It was suggested in the early church, but it wasn't, it wasn't key for the early church, for the first thousand years of our religion. Paradise was very much a this world thing. Paradise was here and now, and it was represented in these pictures of Jesus, always in a meadow. Sometimes he was holding a wand as a healer because in ancient Greek mythology, their healer had a wand. Oftentimes he was, oftentimes he was a shepherd. And he would have, in one very famous picture that's now in the Vatican, he had this lamb draped over his shoulders and he was staring into the face of the lamb and the lamb was staring back at him. That's what paradise was to the early followers of Jesus. Something here, something now. It's what paradise still is for me. 
And I think that's very much what it is here in Psalm 23. It's also what it was for John Calvin. I've been spending the last few weeks reading his commentaries on the book of Psalms. It's a kind of famous book. He wrote some beautiful commentaries. Calvin loved the Psalms. He felt like they addressed all the human emotions that we have. Sorrow, grief, hope, joy, all the emotions that we have relevant to faith and to our lives. He felt the Psalms addressed. The Psalms are also just beautiful, beautiful poetry. I mean, y'all, I read a lot of poetry. And there's not much of it that's quite as exquisite and beautifully written as the Psalms. And Psalm 23, to me, is very much a psalm about paradise here on earth. It is a psalm about life, not death. It's become a bit of a psalm of death in our tradition. We read it a lot at funerals. People request it at funerals. They request it at their bedsides as they're dying. And I get it. It makes complete sense to me. And I think part of that is because of that line, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, but you heard in today's translation, which again, I think is more accurate, that line of the shadow of death is no longer there. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Just like the pictures of the Lord we see in the first thousand years of our religion's history. Shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me to water in places of repose. Paradise. That feeling that we get, that you can get, when you're living in the Lord, when the Lord is your shepherd, that feeling you can get no matter what is going on in your world or in your life. Though I walk through a valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice it doesn't say that bad things aren't going to happen to you. They are out there. And they are going to happen. This valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm. doesn't say harm won't visit you. It just says you're not going to fear it. You don't need to fear it. Yeah, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick at times. We're going to lose our jobs. We're going to have marital difficulties. We're going to have a struggle raising our kids. These things are going to happen. But you don't need to fear them. That's the paradise that our early church knew. And that's the paradise that our early church strove to achieve every day. My friends, I know our lives can be difficult. They can be very, very difficult. But, boy, the lives that, the, <laughs> the lives that people had to endure in the early church... I mean, that was tough. I mean, at least now we have Novocaine. That makes me giddy. <laughs> yes, we do know illness. We know illness. God, we've been in this COVID thing for two years now, and it seems like it's never going to end. We do know it. But life expectancy in the first century was 25, the age of 25. Only one of three children ever born survived. Yeah, our friends, they know hunger. We know some people who know hunger, and food is very expensive right now. But 85% of the population in the days of the early church was at or below subsistence level. They knew hunger. They knew pain. They knew severity. They knew early death. And yet, and yet they still found paradise. They found paradise here on earth under those circumstances. How? Well, they followed Jesus. They did as Jesus commanded us to do. 
From the fourth century, there's a very famous poet. His name is Ephraim the Syrian, and he was a poet. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian. He was a deep and abiding follower of Jesus. In one of his poems, he wrote this. One person falls sick, and so another can visit him and help him. One person starves, and so another can provide him with good and give him life. One person does something stupid, but he can be instructed by another and thereby grow. In this way, the world can recover. Tens of thousands of hidden ways are to be found, ready to assist us. That's how we get there. That is how we get to paradise in this world, in this time, on this earth. Now, we help the sick, we feed the hungry, we seek wisdom together, together. We do that by coming to Bible study, by studying scripture, by coming to church, by earnestly exploring scripture, reading it in ways we haven't before, seeing what else it might be telling us. We appreciate the beauty of this world, the natural beauty, the beauty of art, the beauty of each other. That's how we get there. It is possible. That's what paradise was for our church the first thousand years. That's the paradise I'm interested in. That's what I'm striving for. My friends, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if there's an afterlife. Nobody does. And I don't really care. I don't think that much about it. I just don't. If it's there, great. And if it is there, I truly believe that all will be there. All, no exceptions. That to me is what the grace of God means. But what I also know is that the earliest church felt that even if there was a paradise in the afterlife, there's no reason to delay it. Let's find the paradise here. Let's establish a paradise here on earth. And I know it's possible. I go to that paradise often. I was there Friday. Friday, we had our welcome table. We were down there and the crew was cooking food for the hungry who needed it. And we were all there and we were sitting and we were talking and we were laughing and we were having a good time. And then in walked another client, someone who needed some food. And someone mentioned to her, said, hey, I heard you had a beautiful voice. And she said, yeah, would you like me to sing a song? And everyone said, sure. And so she sang. Just the most beautiful voice. She sang a hymn, a cappella, and it was exquisite. And there we all were. We all have our problems. Some health problems, some marital problems, some money problems. Yeah, we all had them. But there we all were. There we all were in a community of Christ, dedicated to feeding those who needed it. And listening to this woman sing a beautiful hymn. At that moment, we were all lying in green pastures. We were all lying in places of waters of repose. And that taste of paradise, it stayed with me the whole day. May it be so for you. Amen. Thank you.
God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green, of quiet Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you are with me, you are with me. of God forever. In life and death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to eternal life. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life 
or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As always, if there's any way First Presbyterian can be of assistance to you, please contact the church office at office at beaconpresbychurch.org or call 845-831-5322. And if you would like to support the ongoing ministry of First Presbyterian Church, you can send a donation to 50 Liberty Street, Beacon, New York, 12508, or give an online contribution through our website, beaconpresbychurch.org. Stay connected to the life and people of FPC by joining our First Presby Community Facebook group, as well as sign up to receive our weekly email newsletter. And now, a blessing. May you be at peace wherever you are. Remember those who are out in the world. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you are, may the love of God, the faith of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Oh,